Our guest is Ambassador William B. Taylor. Ambassador Taylor served as U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine from 2006 to 2009. He's currently Vice President for the Middle East and Africa at the United States Institute of Peace. Ambassador Taylor formerly served as Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions for the U.S. State Department. Ambassador, good to sit and talk with you. Thank you, Dennis. Great to be here. Putin called President Obama. Did Putin blink? You know, I think he might have. I think he might have. I think that the economic sanctions uh -huh. that, that the United States put on and that, that the Europeans followed and put on themselves, I think it's begun to have an effect. Uh -huh. uh, that, that's my sense. I mean, I, I could be wrong because no one can look into this man's mind. Uh, he's hard to understand, hard to follow, but he made the call, and today we hear that he has actually ordered a partial stand down. We haven't seen the troops move yet, uh -huh. and we won't, shouldn't believe it until we see the troops move. But I believe the answer to your question is yes. Wow. You were ambassador to Ukraine for three years. Three years. Tell us about the country, the people, the area, and why it's important. The country is a very interesting one, right in the middle of what we think of of Europe. If we think of Europe as going from the Atlantic to the Urals Mountains, mm -hmm. Ukraine is smack in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's right in the middle. It's a big country. It's as big as France. It's actually bigger than France. It's got 45 million Ukrainians living there. Mm -hmm. So that makes it important um, in that just uh, geographically it's important. It's at the center. Demographically it's important. It's so big. But the history of the place is very interesting. It's on the border. Now, in particular, uh -huh. it's on the border between Russia on the one side and Europe on the other. Uh -huh. And that makes it important to both Russia and to Europe. Uh -huh. The Poles are very interested to see this big, important country be friendly, even a part of the European Union. The Russians hate that idea. Uh -huh. The Russians want to be sure that this big, important country Ukraine is part of their sphere of influence. Now, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. our view is that there are no spheres of influence anymore, and Ukraine and Ukrainians ought to make the decision. So getting to your question about the people, yeah. yep. it's, in my experience there, a peaceful people. Mm -hmm. These are not belligerent people. They've been in the middle. Um, they've been pulled into battles for the Soviets uh, during Afghanistan, it was largely Ukrainians who were sent, as 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 part of the Soviet Union, that were sent to fight in Afghanistan. Wow. Oh, interesting. Even in World War II, the uh -huh. Ukrainians bore a heavy burden um, in the in the terrible battles that the Soviets fought with the Germans. Mm -hmm. So the the Ukrainians have gone through a lot. In the 30s, Stalin intentionally starved Ukrainians. Mm. Millions died. Millions of Ukrainians died of starvation. Mm -hmm. So they've been through a lot. They are by and large a peaceful, tolerant people, um, and they deserve better than, than they're getting from, from the Russians. Were you surprised uh, at uh, Putin's move to uh, annex uh, Crimea? I was. Yeah? I was. Um, since the end of the Cold War, Indeed, really, since World War II, there have not been military moves in Europe to change borders. Yes, 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 yes. Um, and so this did surprise me. This was not, this, this broke the norms of international behavior. Right. It, of course, broke treaties and broke understandings, solemn commitments. Uh, the Ukrainians, here's another example. The Ukrainians in 1992, when the Soviet Union disappeared, disintegrated. Right, 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 right. They inherited from the Soviet Union the third largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Mm -hmm. um, they had to decide what to do with right, this. Right, so they, right. they could have kept those nuclear weapons. They decided, in my view, very responsibly, uh -huh. to turn them back, not to keep them. But they struck a bargain with the Russians and the Americans and the Brits. Uh, if we Ukrainians give up these, this large nuclear arsenal, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what will you give us? What will you assure us? What guarantees do we have that you won't 
turn on us someday, that you, what guarantees do we have that you will defend us if our territorial integrity is threatened, our mm -hmm, sovereignty mm -hmm, is threatened? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we signed, the Brits signed, yeah. and the Russians signed an agreement assuring the security of the Ukrainians. Well, the Russians have violated that. Yes, and uh, President Obama said that there will be a, a price to pay, but at the beginning, there wasn't much of a price that was paid, huh? Well, in the beginning, uh, he had, President Obama had to think about what kind of price it would be. Mm -hmm. And in the first instance, it has been an economic price. It's been yes. economic sanctions mm -hmm. on people in Moscow who made those decisions that surprised me, mm -hmm. surprised others, uh, to send those Russian troops into Crimea. Mm -hmm. So he, President Obama and his administration identified those Russians in decision-making roles or, or advisory roles and put sanctions on them mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. they can't travel, mm -hmm. um, their assets are seized, those, yep. they have these kinds of restrictions on them. Then the Europeans followed those up and they did the same kind of thing, put yep. the same kind of restrictions on. Mm -hmm. In the beginning, people said some of those people who were uh, some of those Russians who were sanctioned, kind of laughed it off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They didn't take yeah, it yeah, seriously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But um, as they began to see that this was serious and could get more serious, yes, they began to have second thoughts. And I believe those economic sanctions by the Americans and by the Europeans were the cause of Mr. Putin's phone call last Friday to President Obama. So, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, there is a call by some people up on the Hill, senators who are well versed in international relations, for a stronger push. But you seem to suggest that the president has played it fairly well, huh? I think so. Th there are those who would take a somewhat stronger uh, position, yeah. not very much. I mean, uh -huh. I don't hear anyone talking about sending troops mm -hmm. into Crimea mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. try to kick the Russians out of Crimea. I don't hear right. anybody talking about no, that. No, they're in there. And they're there. They're staying. However, they're, they're there. However, just a little footnote, um, we shouldn't accept that. We should not accept that presence of the Russians. That is, we should continue to maintain that they are there illegally, uh -huh. that they are there without any sanction from the international community. Of course, the Russians lost a vote in the Security Council, yes. 13 to 1 to 1. Mm -hmm. uh, the one abstention was China, mm -hmm. its own mm -hmm. ally. Yes. The Russians. And then it lost a big vote in the General Assembly, 100 to 11, Yes, uh, with a lot of uh, abstentions. Um, but the Russians are isolated on this. And that, that general agreement by the international community and even on the Hill, that is that the Russians are there illegally, um, that's, that unites Republicans and Democrats. Now, there are some Republicans who would take a little bit stronger view and position on military actions. Um, but what can you do? You, no, uh, even they don't say send yeah. in the 101st. Yes. Um, uh, but what they do say is maybe move some troops up closer to the border. Aha. Maybe reinstitute this missile defense uh, in Europe. Uh, maybe there are other kinds of things. Now, my own view is there are a couple of things on the military side that we could do beyond just the economic. We could continue the military to military relationship that we have, that we, the United States, have with the Ukrainians. Okay. When I was there, um, I participated myself in some military training um, with the Ukrainian military. Um, I, in my embassy there, we had a defense attache, and the defense attache and his staff we're in constant communication and discussion and advice and joint exercises with the Ukrainians. Those we could continue, and I think we probably will continue. Uh, let's hold on that note. Uh, I want to say to the folks at home, uh, we're talking with Ambassador William Taylor, uh, formerly the Un United States Ambassador to Ukraine. He's also uh, Vice President of the uh, U.S. Uh, Institute of Peace. want to talk about that and has served in various capacities, especially with the role of assistance that the United States provides countries all over the world. So talk a little bit about that. Sit tight. This is America and the world.
This is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S. China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing, and distribution services. Mr. Ambassador, have you ever been uh, up close with uh, Vladimir Putin? I have not. Uh -huh. I have not. And I'm just as glad that I haven't. Um, I, Why do you say that? I say that because uh, this, man, uh, this man is hard to understand. He has fooled many smarter people than me uh -huh. um, about who he really is. Oh. Um, he fooled some very senior uh, officials in the U.S. government. I think he's fooled some people in the German government and others. Yeah. Uh, we cannot trust this man. So huh. I, I, I'm, I'm happy not to know this man well. So, so is he a thug? I don't know that he's a thug. I think he is, a, we know he's a former KGB colonel. Yes. Um, we know what the KGB did. Um, that's of a piece um, with, with what we are now seeing. He rose to the presidency fairly quickly, didn't he, from that KGB position? He did. He did. Uh, he was a deputy out in uh, St. Petersburg um, uh, with, uh, with other people and then was identified by Mr. Yeltsin as the successor. Yeah. Um, and then was elected president, and then when term limits got in the way, he was made, he made himself the prime minister and then ran again for the president. Yes. So he can he's, be- He's very clever. He's very clever. Very clever. He, he's very clever, uh, which is, I think, an important point. He is not crazy. He is not crazy. He, uh, he may be calculating things differently What's from the- What's his goal? What's his mission? What's, what does he want? Again, I don't know, yeah. but I'll, I'll make some guesses for you, Dennis. <laughs> yep. uh, mm -hmm. Um, my bet is he is still angry about the end of the Soviet Union. He's called it the greatest disaster of the last century. Yeah. Um, he feels like the West, Europe, the United States, has taken advantage of the collapse of the Soviet Union and sees conspiracies, um, where in my view, there are none. Um, he sees conspiracies about what happened in Ukraine earlier. There was uh, what we know as the Orange Revolution just mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. I got there in mm -hmm. 2004, 2005, um, that he blames, Mr. Putin blames on America. He says the United States caused those uh, and supported those and was the, was the instigator of those color revolutions. So my, again, I don't know the man, and I, I wouldn't want to try to guess what's going on in his head, um, but there seems to be some lingering anger, lingering irritation at those perceived slights. Has he kind of absorbed uh, a kind of a feeling of like Russia was humiliated by the breakup of the Soviet Union, and he is humiliation personified? I mean, is, is, am I on the right track there, or did I just make that up? No, I think you're, you're basically on the right track. I don't know if he feels it personally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but as the leader of Russia, um, he takes the responsibility to try to bring Russia back. The, the Sochi Olympics, pretty good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pre pretty expensive. Yeah. Pretty good job. The security was better than some people feared. Um, the, the athletics were spectacular. Um, the presentation were all spectacular. But did he self-destruct after such a grand performance? The grand performance cost him something like 50 or 60 billion dollars. Yeah. And then the next week, he sends his troops into Crimea, yes. destroying any benefit, any yes. goodwill, any respect 
that Russia might have gained from those So would a psychiatrist or a psychologist come along and say he has a self-destruct mechanism? Uh, you're more of a psychologist than I am, uh, Dennis. Uh, so you'll, you'll have a better sense of that. But uh, th this is, a, this is a, he's a hard one to figure out. You're a military man, military background. Uh, Vietnam, Germany, West Point. Um, when he sends these Russian troops in the unmarked uniforms into Crimea, and that plays out, and then all of a sudden there's a referendum and they vote to get out. What do you make of that from a military point of view, and how has this put NATO back in business? On the last part, putting NATO back in business, I think one of the other things that Mr. Putin didn't anticipate um, was the effect that his move into Crimea would have on NATO. NATO, I, I served at NATO. I served at NATO in 1987 to 1992. Uh -huh. And so in 1989, while I was there, um, the wall fell, Berlin Wall fell. And in 1991, right at the end of 1991, the Soviet Union disappeared. So NATO at that point was asking itself, what's the point? What are we here to do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for the last 20 years, the NATO has been looking for other things to do. And, 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 and just uh, historically, it, it started right after the end of the Second World War? It started, uh, late, late. it started several years after that, right, yeah. about 1949. 40, I, yeah, think, I, think, I, think, yep. I think that's exactly right. And, and, and somebody said that the first secretary general of whatever his position was, that George Will wrote this in a column right. recently, right. Uh, keep Russia out. out, the Germans down, <laughs> and the, the Americans and, in. And the Americans exactly. in. What a lot. And it did that for a long time. Yeah. Did that for a long time. Yeah. Um, now, we don't talk so much about the Germans anymore, but, no, no, but, no, no, but, no. but you're exactly right. Now we are reminded, after 22 years, why we needed NATO, um, because the Russians have turned out to be a threat again. Mm -hmm. Threat. Follow up on that. How so? Uh, a threat because there are now members of the NATO alliance who have large Russian populations. Oh, yes. And Mr. Putin has said he believes it's his responsibility to protect these Russian-speaking populations no matter where they are. And they're in Estonia um, and Latvia. Um, and Estonia and Latvia are now in NATO. Mm -hmm. um, if Mr. Putin were to make good on his threat to go, in and go into those NATO member countries and protect the Russians. That's an attack on NATO. That's an and Article 5 of the NATO Treaty says that attack on one is attack on all. So that would yeah, be yeah, like yeah, an yeah, attack yeah, on yeah, us. Yeah. Yes, yes, and, yes, yes. And that is, that's serious business. So when, uh, when folks are looking at this, uh, the military possibility of, uh, well, let's, let's, let's look at it in a different fashion. Would you say that the military feasibility of, uh, say, uh, further in, in, in uh, uh, going into Ukraine, that's off the table now for Russia? He won't do that, huh? I hope he doesn't do that. I think uh -huh. it would be a terrible mistake for him to do that. From a military standpoint, I think our immediate response um, would be to further bolster the NATO alliance. Mm -hmm. But I think we would also couple that with further, very harsh okay, economic sanctions. Okay, that's what sanctions. I want to ask you. What could those be? What could those be if he missteps? If he missteps um, and sends Russian forces into Ukraine proper, if you mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. um, so like the eastern? Uh, on, on the Ukraine eastern border, his yep. western mm -hmm. border. Mm -hmm. If he were to send, the, and there's still a lot of troops, ma Russian troops right. massed there, prepared to do that. If he were to send them in, the economic sanctions that we would put on, and President Obama has already establish the authority to do the, exactly this, we would sanction big sections of sectors of his economy. Energy. Oh, yes. Defense. Uh. Finance. Engineering. Uh, these sectors of his economy would be cut off fr from the international financial institutions, in particular if the U Europeans followed suit. Europeans have followed suit so far yes, on have. the economic sanctions. Yes. If they were to follow suit uh, in these broader sectoral sanctions, it would be devastating for the Russians. Their economy is not so strong now anyway. So, but uh, Germany, France, and Britain 
are trading partners, are they not? They are. They are. Uh, the Germans get a lot of their natural gas uh, from, from Russia. Uh -huh. The Brits um, have a lot of the Russian oligarchs that own big property in London. Ah. Lots of property we in could, London. We could uh, padlock those doors. We could, we could, but the Brits also recognize that there are a lot of financial dealings that the Russians do in London, and they're hesitant to, to, to jeopardize that. The French are about to sell two big naval warships to the Russians. That's a lot of uh, employment in France. So the, the Brits, the Germans, and the, and the, and the uh, French have economic stakes. So it will be a harder decision for those European countries to follow our suit in these strong economic sanctions. But I believe, I believe they will. Yeah, yeah. So keep the pressure on. Keep the pressure on. Keep the pressure on. Uh, let me talk uh, a little bit about the uh, U.S. Uh, Institute of Peace. Of not peace. For, not for well, peace. we are for peace, but, yes, but we, it's the but Institute of, of Peace. That's right. Uh, you look at the world today, and we've got Syria, uh, we've got North Korea, we've got Iran, we've got Ukraine. Uh, so the we, Institute of Peace is not doing a very good well, job. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> right, what, I'm right. saying, what, I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, like, you're, you've... you've served the country in so many different fashions. But if you look at, say, like Israel-Palestine, you brought people around the table at the Institute. Uh, is there hope there? I mean, boy, Senator, uh, not Senator, Secretary Kerry now has really invested such a great deal in trying to get something going. He has. He has. And he deserves, gr I think, mm -hmm. great credit for his doggedness, his persistence um, in that issue. I believe the answer is yes, it's possible. Um, it, it, it has defied every president, every yeah. secretary of state, every yeah. special envoy in the past. Yep. And Secretary Kerry could have just said, it's too hard, uh -huh. but he didn't. Um, he's trying very hard, just even today, he's trying very hard to get them to continue to sit down, talk about a two-state solution. Ah, uh, you're invested over there as vice president in, in, in Africa and the Middle East are two of the areas that you're focused on. Um, what's cooking, what, what's got your attention over there right now? You've mentioned one, the Arab-Israeli, yes. Palestinian-Israeli issue. Yeah. Syria is another, and yes. we're working, that's a, that's a hard one, but we are doing some work with uh, tr training Syrian opposition um, in, in their attempts to uh, learn how to govern. They need to be able to establish themselves to deliver yes, services yes, yes, in yes. Syria if they are to, to take over uh -huh. uh, from uh, Bashar al-Assad. Does your heart break when you look at what's happening in Egypt? It breaks. In Egypt? It breaks. It is so disappointing. Um, Arab Spring, Great Arab, Hopes. Arab Spring, Great Hopes. Good election. Yes. Free and fair election. Yeah. And then an incompetent Mr. Morsi, President mm -hmm, Morsi, mm -hmm. um, and he, my view, he should have just been let, let stay in office and then vote him out. I mean, that's yeah, what yeah, democracies yeah, yeah. do. That was good. Yep. Uh, democracies should have let him stay in, you know, let him stay in office, and vote against him the next time. But no, they didn't. The, yeah. There's a counter revolution, and so the this now does the army's back, up. and the army is back, and so it's it's in Egypt. It's like the Arab Spring didn't happen. Yeah. They're back to where they were. Uh, you have played a role in transitions and assistance in Baghdad, in uh, Kabul, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe. I'm leaving out a couple of uh, middle, middle... Jerusalem, yeah, and, yep, uh, exactly. Uh, Gaza, yeah, right, with right, that whole thing. Right. When does... Uh, tell us a success story of U.S. assistance. Uh, you know, it's easy to talk about waste, corruption, blah, 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 blah. We're going to give a billion dollars to Ukraine bring it full circle. How, give us a success story of U.S. assistance. Well, I'll give you a couple. Okay. Um, one success story in Ukraine, in your last point, is while I was there and before me and after me, the United States and Europeans, by the way, spent a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money strengthening civil society. Civil society. So we're talking about independent media. We're talking about political parties. We're talking about, about training for political parties. We didn't support politicians, but we supported political parties as they figured out how to do constituent services. Um, small businesses, 
um, uh, small organizations of people and even large organizations of people, labor unions, the whole range of non-government organizations that have now proven their worth. It was civil society who came to the independent square, to the Maidan that we call it, um, in, in Kyiv. Um, it was civil society. It wasn't the government. It was civil society. It was independent media who followed that on the, on the news every day. That, that is a real success. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for your service to the country, and uh, we'd love to have you come back uh, once again. Dennis, I'd love to be back. For information about my new book, The Chance of a Lifetime, and online video for all This Is America programs, visit our website, thisisamerica.net. And now you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. This Is America is brought to you by the National Education Association, the U.S.-China Education Trust, and the F.Y. Chang Foundation. The League of Arab States, representing 350 million people in 22 member countries. The Rotondaro Family Trust. The Embassy Series, uniting people through musical diplomacy, presenting international artists in diplomatic settings. The Republic of Kazakhstan in the heart of Eurasia, a rich history, a culture of hospitality, and a future of development and growth. And Ventana Productions, television facilities, editing and distribution services.